Thank you everyone for joining us on this um this chilly evening. We might begin the uh the presentation as people uh people join they can um catch it up to speed. So as I said, thank you um everyone for attending uh, tonight's webinar hosted by Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network. Uh, tonight's session is on atopic dermatitis. Um, before we begin, uh, Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our work takes place, the Rwandri Woiwurrung people, the Boon Warung people, and the Wathurrung people. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today. So just a bit of a housekeeping for you all. Look, I'm sure you're all um, you know, experts on Zoom by now, but just to go over a few things, um, all attendees will be muted um, throughout the, the webinar. If you do have any questions for our speakers, there's a Q&A box just at the bottom of your screens. Um, so feel free to type any questions in throughout the presentation. Um, there'll also be some opportunities for these to be answered throughout. Um, this session is being um, recorded. However, all questions will, be, will remain anonymous to protect your privacy. Um, and please ensure that the name you're joining with is um, your correct name. Um, so this way our um, education team can mark down your attendance. So to our uh, speakers for tonight's session. Um, so we have Associate Professor Kern is yeah, the author of over 60 articles in international peer-reviewed journals and a recipient of multiple research awards. His interests include general dermatology, skin cancer, autoimmune and blistering skin disease, treatment diagnosis, clinical trials, and translational research. We also have Dr. Honey as a doctor of medicine, completed an internship of two years of residency prior to her current role as the Dermatology Clinical and Trials Fellow at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And finally, we have Dr. Anthony, his Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery with honours, currently a fellow in the Dermatology Clinical Trials Department at Royal Melbourne Hospital, with his research work published in multiple journals. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to our speakers to uh, begin tonight's presentation. Yeah, thanks very Thank much. You. Um, th thanks, uh, PHN, for hosting us and also for the uh, GP liaison team at Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, I can see Sue's here as well, who have um, helped quite a bit. And of course, thank you very much for joining us on a pretty cold and rainy day. Um, the reason why we were keen to present this uh, is that, you know, atopic dermatitis is obviously very common and as you know, and you see very much of this in primary care. And as a dermatologist also, we see atopic dermatitis pretty much every day, um, can be quite a significant disease with um, sometimes challenging to treat. Uh, but in over the last year, really, we've had a quite significant change in the treatment with new targeted therapies having become uh, available on the PBS. Um, we are also running at the Royal Melbourne Hospital large clinical trial center uh, and um, Dr. Anthony Honeyman and Dr. Honey Wu will also um, uh, present on some of the newer treatments that will also come because we will today show a general overview to see a little bit about uh, atopic dermatitis in general, which you usually know. We've included a few clinical pearls, which we felt were maybe helpful because, um, you know, in my clinical practice, we do see sometimes challenging presentations, things that might be helpful for you to maybe you already know, but might also be helpful to know. But then we'll talk quite a bit about the targeted therapies and um, about what may be coming, because I think many patients, GPs are not so aware that they're also trials that may be um, um, interesting for the patients. Um, and I find in particular, many patients are not aware of the new treatments that are available. Um, a lot of patients obviously are disengaged from the medical sector because every time they come to see us, we've recommended them ultra potent corticosteroids. So they feel there's nothing to gain from seeing a dermatologist. That's why we felt we want to give you an update. So um, you can maybe convince your patients to see us. Um, 
<clears throat> and then yeah, we'll jump right in. So Dr. Anthony Honeyman will start straight away with an overview and then hand over to uh, Dr. Honey Wu. Anytime, please feel free to pop any questions in the Q&A. We can maybe at the end discuss uh, as well. We've got two little blocks for discussion or otherwise I can also answer in the chat. Thank you. And obviously, thanks very much, Anthony and Honey, for preparing the presentation and presenting today. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Kern. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to, to present to you this evening. Um, as Professor Kern mentioned, my name's Anthony Honigman. I'm one of the dermatology clinic. Alongside Professor Kern and, and Dr. Honey Oo, um, who is our other research fellow who will also be presenting um, this evening. And really, as, as Professor Kern mentioned, we'll be discussing atopic dermatitis with particular focus on the emerging treatments um, that we as clinicians will be, will be seeing in the coming years. So we are running um, a number of atopic dermatitis clinical trials at Royal Melbourne Hospital, and therefore we do have some conflicts of interest to declare. So today's presentation, we wanted to really start off by having a brief overview of atopic dermatitis its epidemiology, its pathogenesis and, and clinical presentations, which I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with. And then we really wanted to share some clinical pearls that, that may assist with managing conditions that, that may be associated with atopic dermatitis or mimic it clinically in, in some form. And, and then we'll move on to, to managing the disease as well as providing a, a little showcase of, of what clinical trials um, are available for adult atopic dermatitis at, at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. So I'm sure everyone knows about health pathways and um, more than I do, um, but in a nutshell, it's a free online platform that, that provides GPs with best practice and evidence-based information to help um, assess, to, to manage and refer on patients. And, and not only that, it supports and provides resources to, to patients to make informed decisions and then to refer on to specialists if needed. And there are um, relevant pathways for atopic dermatitis for both adult and, and pediatric populations. So we wanted to make it a little bit interactive uh, to begin with, and we wanted to, to, to create a poll. Um, and there's really two questions that we wanted to ask initially, and that's, do you frequently see patients with adult eczema? And secondly, if you do, do you manage most of your patients with eczema yourself? or do you refer to a medical specialist? So feel free to jump in and answer those questions as, as you can throughout the, the presentation. Okay. I'm just wondering if I can minimize that poll that's right in my screen. Can I ask, is we that can poll? Add that poll first now, or if we'd like, and we can all have a, a look at the results. Yep. And is it possible to, to remove that from the front of the screen? Should I yeah, stop sharing? Has that disappeared for you now? Uh, still there, unfortunately. Click but, on the um, little red button. So most people do see atopic dermatitis, unsurprisingly, and most people manage primarily themselves, which we also expect. So hopefully today we can show a little bit on when you should send on. Okay, I'll let you. Okay, I can move on there though. That's all right. So, so let's get so let's get started. I'm I'm sure we all know that atopic dermatitis or atopic eczema is a, a chronic relapsing and, and remitting inflammatory skin disease. And it's by far the most common uh, dermatitis and affects approximately 230 million people worldwide, up to 20% of children and 7% of the adult population. And there's obviously um, large variations among countries and ethnic groups as well. In Australia, it affects 1 million people and one in three children will suffer from atopic dermatitis. There's a lifetime prevalence of 10 to 15% and it typically starts in early childhood with over half of atopic dermatitis sufferers experiencing symptoms before the age of one. 
and 90% before the age of five. So it's very much starting typically in childhood. And it's also important to note that those with atopic dermatitis um, are more likely to go on to develop food, um, environmental allergies, um, asthma, hay fever. So there's, there's this flow on effect that comes with the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. And as I mentioned, um, it is a chronic disease and it's important to remember that there is no cure for eczema, atopic eczema. It really only can be managed and it's therefore imperative um, for us as health professionals to, to have a sound understanding of eczema and how to treat it. So the pathogenesis of, of atopic dermatitis, uh, what's really important to, to take home here is that it's multifactorial and involves genetic, um, immune and environmental factors. And firstly, um, what's important here is that those with atopic dermatitis tend to have an inherited, inherited um, barrier defect in their skin. And this is really the primary issue, which is in large part due to a mutation in the uh, FLG gene, which is responsible for producing filaggrin, um, which is a vital um, protein um, in the structure um, of the epidermis. So if there is abnormal filaggrin expression from the FLG gene, there'll be a disruption and uh, a, a distortion in the epidermis, meaning there'll be these microscopic gaps or chinks in the armour, um, which allows for increased permeability in and out of the skin, um, meaning irritants and bacteria can get in and importantly, moisture can escape out and that leads to dry and itchy skin. And also individuals with the FLG gene um, are more likely to be unable to make as much of those oils, those fats, and those natural moisturizers that do protect our skin. And secondly, there's the immune system that plays a role and it plays, um, well, it's really uh, more of a disturbance or a dysregulation of the immune system. Those with um, atopic eczema, we know that they tend to have a higher number of T helper lymphocyte cells and associated um, inflammatory cytokine cells as well. So again, this contributes to a loss of normal skin barrier function as well as promoting inflammation. And finally, um, it's the role also of the skin microbiome and how that may play uh, a, a factor in, in, in eczema pathogenesis as well. And we know that atopic dermatitis tends to, or those with atopic dermatitis tend to um, have or be colonized with Staph aureus bacteria, which can produce antigens um, that stimulate an immune response. And that leads to a flare or a, uh, a secondary bacterial infection. And a flare is often accompanied by proliferation of more Staph aureus um, on the skin as well. Um, and a reduction in the um, biodiversity of the skin microbiome. So, so that's really an interesting novel theory as well that's taking shape too. So I mentioned um, that the pathogenesis is multifactorial, but the discovery of the filaggrin gene mutation um, has really changed how we understand atopic dermatitis. And it's the primary issue, but it's not the sole issue. Um, and that, that being that there is a defect in the structure of the barrier of the skin. And initially it was thought that um, immunosuppressive medications wouldn't be able to effectively treat disease. But interestingly, what we've found is that most complete and effective management plans um, for atopic dermatitis, uh, they target both the barrier defect and, and the immune response as well. So the clinical presentation, I'm sure everyone's familiar with, but it tends to be itchy, red with scaly lesions. Uh, it may also be crusting or weeping and more commonly, but um, not always uh, affecting the flexural surfaces of the body. Um, also, there is, due to the chronic nature of disease over time, the skin that becomes thickened or um, lichenified and fissuring can also occur. Diagnosis is, is often a clinical one and, and doesn't really, or doesn't require a biopsy or any laboratory testing. And, and the vast majority of atopic dermatitis patients are, are diagnosed in the primary care setting. So before we move on to the eczema treatment, we thought we'd provide some clinical pearls um, that may assist with managing conditions that may be associated with atopic dermatitis or, um, or mimic it in some form. So firstly is infected atopic dermatitis. So we know that those with atopic dermatitis are susceptible to skin infections due to the disruption of the epidermis. 
and staph, staphylococcal bacteria uh, are part of the normal bacterial flora. However, 90% of patients with atopic dermatitis are colonised with staph aureus bacteria, which, as I mentioned earlier, not only promotes um, an inflammatory response, but also increases the risk of, of a secondary skin infection. So staph aureus um, causes impetigo skin infections, like the image in the, the top middle, um, as you can see there. Um, and also streptococcal is another bacteria, particularly strep pyogenes, that can lead to secondary bacterial infections too. And this is often seen with impetigo and, and pustules as well on the top right of screen. And this is treated with a course of targeted oral antibiotics um, and bleach baths as well. And, and that's something we'll be discussing um, later on in this talk. We'll just go back. There's also viral um, skin infections that can be a complication of, of atopic dermatitis as well. And most cases are, are due to the herpes simplex virus, particularly if they are localized. Um, and another complication um, is eczema herpeticum, which is seen in the bottom right image, um, which is really a disseminated viral infection. And it's characterized by clusters of itchy uh, blisters and erosions and systemic symptoms as well. Patients will feel generally unwell and, and have fever. And again, most of the cases of eczema herpeticum um, are due to herpes simplex uh, type 1 or 2. And really with eczema herpeticum, um, it does require prompt treatment with antivirals and, and would warrant a, a specialist referral to a dermatologist or even an ophthalmologist if there's ocular involvement or if you're particularly concerned to the emergency department as well. So that's something you don't want to miss. Um, contact dermatitis is um, a, a skin reaction due to contact with a, a causative agent or, or a trigger and can be divided into irritant contact dermatitis and allergic contact dermatitis. So with irritant contact dermatitis, um, that's caused by repeated exposure to um, a substance or, or substances that aggravate the skin. There'll be, with that repeated exposure um, over time, a breakdown in the barrier function of the skin and therefore reducing the ability um, of the skin to protect itself um, against the chemicals or, or the irritant itself. And as a result, you see here, you see redness, scaling, blistering, um, splitter, splitting in these um, um, exposed areas. And um, it's important to think about some common examples of irritants and, and something as common as water and such as repeated hand washing and that, that action um, can be an irritant soaps as well, detergents and, and other industrial chemicals. So really taking a good social um, uh, and occupational history is really important for these patients. And treatment requires um, really the general measures, identifying um, the cause of the irritation and then avoiding that exposure, which isn't always easy, particularly if it's in a workplace. So the rash should slowly clear once exposure is avoided and other general measures, washing hands less, avoiding those soaps and avoiding detergents and using um, personal protective equipment. Um, that's also an important, important treatment, whether it be gloves, shoes, appropriate clothing, um, goggles. Um, these are all um, really important too. Barrier creams provide protection and regular um, use with greasy moisturizers are often beneficial too. Potent topical corticosteroids or oral corticosteroids are often required to, to settle most of these cases. Um, and there are other measures um, such as ultraviolet light, but for that you probably want to refer on to a, to a specialist. And that very allergic quickly, I'll sort of yeah, go, ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to just continue with allergic contact dermatitis, which is caused by an immune reaction to a specific uh, chemical that's come into contact with the skin. So this is a little bit different. Um, it's a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, so it doesn't occur immediately, but rather a few days after exposure um, to the allergen. Um, but I suppose in saying that, um, there has been long-term contact um, with chemicals without any problems in the past. They may still possibly develop an allergic contact dermatitis. So clinically presents similar itchy and weeping rash localised to an area with uh, where the allergic trigger has been present. So for instance, on the hand or the feet might be affected from chemicals in rubber gloves or rubber shoes, the earlobes, the wrists may be affected from um, metal earrings or watch parts containing nickel. 
naturally in saying that nickel tends to be the most common cause of um, allergic contact dermatitis um, and can affect the face as well as the mouth and, and eyelids as well. So if you do suspect allergic contact dermatitis, the patient should have patch testing to identify the cause of the allergy. And this requires um, referral to a specialist um, skin patch testing center. And then from there, the rash should, should improve and slowly clear once the exposure to the allergen is avoided. Topical or oral corticosteroids, again, can tempor temporarily settle um, the allergen as well. Um, but please remember that if your patient isn't responding to treatment, don't hesitate to, to make a referral to a specialist dermatologist or an allergist who may be, may be able to um, assist with the, the treatment of this condition. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly here. So with, um, you know, clinically of, often irritant versus uh, allergic contact dermatitis presents very similar. So it's very much the history you take that will help you. And we've put some photos there. So in particular, you know, areas of concern are the hands, especially if people have occupational exposure, the eyelids we've put there, very common acrylic allergies when people have nail polish. Um, we do have a massive issue. So if, if you suspect allergic contact dermatitis, please do refer to a dermatologist because we're the only ones who can access really patch testing. We do have massive issues because uh, over COVID, all public hospital, we, we did always have a short shortage of patch testing clinics anyway, but over COVID, all the public hospital ones have been stopped. So it's currently only available at the, at the Skin Health Institute and um, takes three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which is difficult for many patients. And in particular, it's a high out of pocket, $800 out of pocket for the patient. I think it warrants a referral to a specialist first to try to work out is it really allergic contact versus irritant contact dermatitis? Obviously, we see a lot more now of contact dermatitis with, uh, you know, the hand washing, the hand sanitizers with COVID as well. Um, and also, at the end of the day, if we can identify a culprit or if we can find a regimen for the patient that works, so pragmatically, if we find a, a, a regimen of externals that they can use that work for them that don't trigger that contact dermatitis, that's also fine, so we can maybe avoid the patch testing just because it's so difficult to access. Yeah. Ideally in every patient that presents like in those pictures, of course, we would want to have patch testing, but in practice we can't really. Sorry, yeah. No, thanks. Thanks, Professor Kent. Okay, move on. Okay, so moving on to, to another form of der dermatitis that's, that's often confused with and, and may resemble atopic dermatitis is, is periorificial or perioral dermatitis. And a patient here will present with um, an eruption um, of, of groups of, of, of tender, itchy red papules or papular pustules affecting the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth, and can even affect the genitals too. And they may uh, complain of a, a associated burning or stinging with these pustules. And this again is, um, a clinical diagnosis and history is, is, is important here as those with perioral dermatitis are often using topical steroids or inhaled corticosteroids, certain makeups and certain sunscreens. Um, so history, again, vital. And management includes those general measures such as discontinuing all face creams and topical steroids, cosmetics and sunscreens, which is also known as zero therapy. Um, and look, it's important to consider a slow withdrawal um, from topical steroids if there is a rebound flare after cessation of therapy. So it's important to keep that in mind too. Um, topical therapy with antibiotics, permecrolimus or azelaic acid um, is, is also beneficial. And in more severe cases, a course of um, anti-inflammatory oral antibiotics, usually with a, a tetracycline or a, or a macrolide such as doxycycline, minocycline or erythromycin can be prescribed. Um, for several weeks, and that, that also helps to reduce the rebound flare as well. And I think it's important to mention in pregnant women to, to, to stick with erythromycin. And, and I'll jump in here quickly too. Um, it's quite yeah. remarkable how often we see patients that have been prescribed super potent topical corticosteroids to, in the face, which you know it can be done as a short term in real classic eczema, but many patients have some sort of rash and then get Elocon ointment prescribed for the face. And of course, the problem is it works when you first prescribe it and then the patient is better. But then you get these massive rebounds, you get the periorificial dermatitis. I think one thing to watch out, and that's also one thing to be aware of, is that very soon it looks like Advantan 
at least one tube will be available over the counter at the chemist. So we're probably going to see a lot more of this. So um, just one, one thing to be aware of and keep an eye out for. Um, one of the most frustrating to treat conditions, so I you know, wouldn't feel bad referring a patient to a dermatologist. Not that we can do magic, but you know, at least, uh, at least we can try. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, um, a little case scenario before we move on to treatments. So we have a 29 year old gentleman who has a 15 year history of atopic dermatitis, initially started on his hands and feet and eventually, eventually spread to his thighs, um, his abdomen, his back and his buttock, as you can see in this image, extremely itchy. Um, he's had previous um, courses of topical corticosteroids, which would initially provide some relief, but would, would lose effect quite rapidly has no past medical history, has no personal history of atopy or family history of atopy. He works full-time as a chef, has no other household members um, that have been affected by um, a similar rash or itch um, and has no pets. So his bloods were all normal. Skin, scraping, skin scrapings um, did not um, show any fungal um, on MCS. There was no growth and a biopsy was taken and the histopathology reported orthokeratosis containing scattered fungal hyphae, um, a moderately acanthalytic epidermis with mild spongiosis, superficial um, perivascular infiltrate of lymphocytes and occasionally eosinophils, and then the subsequent culture showed growth of trichophyton rubrum. So what we do have here is the diagnosis of tinea incognita, which can be difficult to diagnose. So that's um, a name that's given to an atypical fungal skin infection, whereby the clinical appearance um, has been altered or um, masked or um, exacerbated um, by inappropriate treatment. And it's usually by topical corticosteroids. So what results is that um, the original infection slowly extends and the border can become poorly defined. Um, in the image previously, you could see that um, here. Um, and that makes, it's, makes it extremely difficult to diagnose clinically. Trichophyton rubrum tends to be the most common dermatophyte organism that we see. And some patients are actually predisposed to developing fun fungal infections, such as those with diabetes, those who are immunocompromised with HIV or are on immunosuppressive medication. So the treatment for tinea incognita, firstly, any type of topical steroids used to treat the rash previously should be ceased. Topical antifungals can be trialled initially, but really um, oral antifungal therapy is, 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 is appropriate in this case. And we usually reserve oral antifungal therapy for, for, for fungus that is uh, widespread, that's established, um, that, that haven't responded to topical antifungal therapy or those that recur soon after that are inflammatory infection or, or those that have been inappropriately treated with corticosteroids, such as this, this case scenario here. Treatment is oral tobinophene, 250 milligrams once daily um, for approximately two to four weeks and ideally checking the liver function of, of your patients prior to commencing. If that's contraindicated, gluconazole and um, guisofulvin is also other, um, are also other available options um, for your patients. And look, with that, I might um, I'll, I'll, hand over to I'll just quickly um, say as well Please. here, we, we included yeah. this here because it is really not that rare, actually. We see that very regularly in our practice. So really, if you treat with topical corticosteroids, a rash, especially in the groin area, but can be in the face, on the trunk, anywhere that doesn't respond, do have that in mind. It's not always super typical. If you look, if you stand back from the patient, you often see that actually the rash is a little bit annular. And if you ask them, it progresses. The other one is the photo at the bottom. It looks a bit like rosacea, but the giveaway is that it's unilateral and sometimes pustular, it's, it's really not uncommon. So it's always something to keep in mind. Um, uh, and um, obviously the patient will be super grateful. It's also um, one uh, other important thing is really quite itchy. So patients usually come because of the itch. And it's not only immunosuppressed patients or patients that are somewhat unkempt. You know, recently I saw that in a young 35 year old investment banker and he had a really nice big circle from his thighs up over his hips up to the abdomen and he had just been re-prescribed and re-prescribed ilofred ointment. Okay. I might now hand over to, um, to Dr. U, um, my colleague who 
which we'll be um, discussing the available atopic dermatitis treatments. So I'll just stop sharing if that's all right with you, honey. Thank you. All right, Is, can everyone see the screen clearly? Wonderful, perfect. So my name is Honey, I'm one of the Dermatology Clinical and Trials Fellow here at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And I'll be mainly going through the maintenance, um, the management for atopic dermatitis. And it'll be broken down into three main parts. The first one, we'll talk about general measures and also first line management and adjunct therapy. And then we'll move on to targeted therapies that are currently on PBS. And then we'll more, um, we will finally talk about targeted therapies that are more work in progress and our experience with them. So in terms of maintenance therapy, once a patient's been diagnosed with eczema, it is really important for us to not only educate the patient on the diagnosis, but also having an action plan in place, which outlines specific treatments, not only for maintenance, but also to use during flare-ups. And that has been shown to improve adherence and also reduce the disease severity. And this action plan can be easily assessed online through the allergy.org.au. In terms of the principles of maintenance, liberal application of fragrance-free emollients are essential uh, for prevention and treatment and because they help retain and replenish the moisture on the skin. We generally prefer emollients that has a high lipid content and a low water content. So generally for dry eczema with thickened lichenified skin, we would typically use an ointment Whereas wet, weeping, infected eczema, we, an ointment is not going to stay in place, so we would prefer to use a cream in this scenario. Other maintenance therapies that include recommendations include regular bathing, and that hydrates the skin, but also removes the crust and scales and bacteria that might be on the skin as well. The general advice is daily bath with lukewarm water, about five to 10 minutes a day. And patients can either use fragrance-free cleansers or antibacterial wash, such as the Octanescent that can be obtained online as well. And thirdly, in patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, there is, um, they may also benefit from bleach pass. The formula for this is available online on the Royal Children Hospital website. And this is due to the bleach antiseptic and the anti-staphylococcal properties in it. And in these patient wet wraps can also be useful as well. And the specific instructions to teach patients how to use this is also available on the Royal Children's Hospital website. So moving on to flare ups. Topical corticosteroids are the first line of treatment as they decrease the inflammatory immune response in eczema. And overall, there is four classes in terms of potency of topical corticosteroids that can be tailored, their use can be tailored according to the disease severity. So generally, um, just please do know that the potency mometasone in the case of Alicon, Nervazone and Zatamil is actually now available over the um, counter in small quantities. Um, whereas anything above this, if a patient does need anything above the potency class of three, so if they require more than this, please consider referral to a specialist or a dermatologist to see if they can access any other um, therapies. The only thing of note is that for clobidazole, it is a compounded medication for patients to access. Our general principles in using topical corticosteroids is um, essentially go hard, go fast with a proper weaning plan in place. So in terms of, we recommend starting at twice or using twice a day until the lesions are significantly improved or less thick, um, and then to have a proper weaning plan afterwards. In terms of side effects, topical corticosteroids actually have a good safety profile overall, um, but potential side effects include skin atrophy, purpura, and striae, but many of these actually resolve after stopping the topical steroid use. So just another um, adverse effect that you may have um, come across or heard of is when we have the Anthony has already mentioned as well, is the steroid rebound. And this is an um, occurrence when 
topical steroids are seized very abruptly. Or in another case where patients present with a red burning skins or papular pustular rashes, but please note that in the case of steroid withdrawal, it is very rare and it's only occurred after prolonged inappropriate use. So having this, although we're going hard very fast early on, it is really important to have this proper plan in place. And that although I'm putting corticosteroids in a flare up, it is worth noting that they can be used once or twice a week as maintenance therapy. And they've been shown to um, be effective in reducing the occurrences of flare up in patients. In terms of other adjunct therapies that can be used together, it includes topical calcineurin inhibitors, and that includes um, the ones that's currently available in Australia, such as pimicrolimus or the stronger form tacrolimus. Do not tacrolimus also needs to be compounded. They're all um, steroid sparing immunomodulators, and they can be again used as during flare up or also as part of maintenance therapy. And these are particularly um, helpful, especially in thin skin areas such as the face or flexural lesions, where um, more steroid effects might be more prominent. And the other adjunct therapies that's also there is Nerobin um, UVB therapy. But please do note that it's really mainly effective for patients with four types of three and above. So if patients have really fair skin, it is not an effective treatment. In terms of systemic therapies, these used to be the standard therapy previously, but really nowadays systemic corticosteroids is really only used as a short-term bridging therapy when there is a proper um, steroid sparing agent plan in place. And if a patient is requiring more than one prednisone pulses a year, please consider a specialist referral as well. So I'll just ask Hamish if you can kindly put in a few questions before we go on to targeted therapies. Everyone should have that poll launched now. So I appreciate if you can just quickly answer. So the first one is just really, I am aware of new targeted therapies that are currently there for eczema and I'm comfortable discussing these treatment options with, your, um, with my patients. And the second one is, um, gauging your interest in targeted therapies as well. We'll just wait for a few more answers to come in before we share the results. Wonderful. All right, we might show everyone the results there. Yeah. No worries. So everyone Every seems to be interested. <laughs> yes, Prof? Everyone wants to learn more. I guess that's why. <laughs> that's a good thing, I suppose. Um, and we'll be highlighting about currently available targeted therapies as well in the next few slides. Thank you. All right, in the poll. I'll continue with the presentation. Okay, so we'll now be moving on to targeted therapies. And firstly, it's those that are on PBS that are currently on at the moment. There's two agents that are on PBS. One's dupilumab and the other one is ubedacidinib. So for dupilumab or otherwise known as dupixent, it's actually a monoclonal antibody that blocks interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 and acts on the inflammatory pathway in eczema. It was first approved by PVS for use in severe atopic dermatitis in March last year. So we do have a little bit over a year's worth of experience with this medication. It's given as a subcutaneous injection and on maintenance doses, it's given in a 300 milligram force nightly dose. And it's intended as a long-term treatment option. So there are two criteria in which patients are able to access it. The first is if they have widespread eczema throughout the body, or the other way is either significant eczema either localized to the face or significant eczema to on the hands. This is a patient that is um, from our clinics. It's just, we just wanted to show that it can be affected. So 
This patient has significant severe eczema throughout his body. And this is just a year after. And as you can see, his eczema on the chest and also in the legs has pretty much cleared up. So what do we need to do before we actually start patients on dupilumab? So firstly, in our clinic, we actually perform a comprehensive immunosuppressive screen. So that not only includes basic bloods, but also looking at HIV, hepatitis screen, TB, syphilis, and strongyloides as well. And we also actually recommend a baseline optometry review for reasons you'll see later. Once patients are started on dupilumab, we see them about six to eight weeks at first to see if they are tolerating any side effects. And after that, they continue to see us every six months for ongoing scripts. The most common side effects, and given that it's a subcutaneous, um, subcutaneous injection, is a localized injection site reactions, which most patients do tolerate and resolve after a day or two. The main thing to note is there is significant eye symptoms that um, most patients do complain about, mainly conjunctivitis. And that's the reason why on most patients, when we actually start dupilumab, we actually recommend the use of lubricating eye drops at the same time to prevent this from, to reduce the side effects. And if patients continue to complain of persistent eye symptoms, then we refer them to an ophthalmologist to, for further assessment as well. Another side effect that you may have heard of is dupilumab red face. It's where patients present with erythema and scaly, mainly localized to the head and neck region. And the hypothesis for its pathogenesis is an inflammatory response either to yeast on the skin, hypersensitivity to the dupilumab or localized treatment failure. In these cases, they can be successfully treated with topicals such as corticosteroids, calcium urine inhibitors or antifungal creams as well. And I just quickly, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but it, it, it's really groundbreaking to peel them up. It's been available in Europe, in the US, probably for five years, and it took a really long time for Sanofi, the company, to get it listed here in Australia, but it really makes a massive difference. It's really, and we weren't sure that that would ever happen in atopic dermatitis, but it is really very much like we have seen with the biologics in psoriasis. If it doesn't work for every patient, it's about 70% of patients who really have a very good response. But for those patients, it's life-saving. So really for all your very severe eczema patients, that is something to consider and something we couldn't offer until last year. Um, so we'd be very happy to see them. And it's very, uh, we see a lot of grateful patients now that we've introduced. With the side effects, it's interesting to note. So the conjunctivitis seems to be specific to the interleukin-4 in particular. It's not something we had seen before. And some of the newer drugs we will see in the trials probably don't have that side effect. All of the atopic dermatitis targeted therapies, patients tend to have more skin infections, which um, Honey will show now also for the ubatacitinib. Thank you, Clark. So we'll move on to the second agent that's currently on the PBS at the moment. It's ubatacitinib or Rimfolk. It's a JAG inhibitor, and that was only recently approved in February this year. So we have a little bit more limited experience with this. And Different to the dupilumab, it's actually a tablet that is taken daily, and it can be started as 15 milligram, but it can be updosed to 30 milligram daily. The common side effects are upper respiratory tract symptoms, but in terms of long-term side effects, we actually have currently a phase three extension study in our site that is looking at the long-term potential um, side effects currently. Again, workup-wise, is exactly the same in the sense that we perform a comprehensive immunosuppressive screen again. But in terms of monitoring, we believe that it is a little bit more immunosuppressive. And as a result, we pay a particularly close attention to the FEE where absolute neutrophil as well as lymphocyte counts as well. So side effects wise, it's based on our experience, it is immunosuppressive more than the map. We're unsure of the full spectrum of the full potential side effects, but based on our small samples that we've had, there's multiple, we've seen a few different skin infections and generalized infections. In this case of a viral infection with herpes simplex where this gentleman presented, and in the other case where um, 
And this lady presented with a fungal infection on her skin, which was triggered by the Pterosporum ovale or malassezia. And we think that it's an Ig mediated sensitization to the malassezia. And this can be easily treated with topical antifungal solutions as well. And, and I'll, I'll quickly jump in here again. It's really something that we see. We, and of all the patients we started on, there's a few other JAK inhibitors in clinical trials. Not many of them are still on them after more than a year. And, you know, they are all typically patients that do need ongoing treatment. And most of them had problems with skin infections. Obviously, patients with atopic dermatitis are more prone to skin infections anyway, but we do see those side effects. You have to be aware that in the clinical trials, patients are handpicked. So patients usually, patients that have com um, frequent herpes skin infections, for example, are excluded. They're usually young patients, otherwise healthy. Um, I'm saying this because patients are, when, you know, at the moment we've got these two options, JAK inhibitor, upadacitinib tablet versus topilumab injections, and patients feel often our tablet is maybe easier, but definitely the JAK inhibitor is more immunosuppressive than the injection. Um, so we need to have a good discussion with that, uh, about that with them. You will probably see patients with RINVOC not infrequently because for some reason, Australia is a global outlier in rheumatoid arthritis. RINVOC is probably the most prescribed uh, targeted therapy. And in, in Europe, in the US, there's a reasonably small uptake, but here it's really very frequently prescribed. Just, to just before I came here in the rooms, I saw a 70-year-old lady with rheumatoid arthritis who's really well controlled on her upadacitinib for the rheumatoid arthritis, but she gets recurrent tinea in the face and in the groin. It's now the second time this year that she needs systemic therapy. So it's really something to be aware of. And it's something where uh, that you need to know as well, because obviously patients will come back to you. And it's something that I would definitely mention to a patient before they go on this therapy, even though it's easy, it's a tablet. Sounds easier, but potentially more side effects. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. This is a slide just really to remind everyone that if a patient is presenting with significant skin infections um, that is widespread and systemically unwell or infection that is involving the eyes, please consider calling the dermatology registrar on call at the tertiary centers for further advice or telling the patient to present to the emergency department. But otherwise, if it is a severe patient that is hemodynamically stable, but requiring frequent uses of systemic steroids, then you might want to consider a outpatient dermatology referral for further access to these therapies. So this is a bit of the exciting part where we actually talk about these two trials that we currently have that are, we are open and recruiting. So if there's any patients with eczema that may potentially benefit from this, please do not hesitate to contact us. So the two trials are one's Kymab and the other one is Evilo. So the Kymab is the study is a phase 2b study is a placebo controlled and the investigated product is an anti ox ligand and this blocks the antigen presenting cell interaction with the t-cells and acts again on the inflammatory pathway this is a subcutaneous injection and this time it's given four weekly once patients go on this trial they have an 80 percent chance of getting the medication earlier in the trial the other study, Evilo study, is slightly different and unique. It's also a phase two placebo controlled trial, and that's available for um, all severity of atopic dermatitis. But the investigative product here is actually a bacteria. It's Probotella histicola, which is a gram negative anaerobic common cell that is found in our body, which is thought to secrete anti inflammatory cytokines, and that again works on the inflammatory pathway. This is different in the sense that it's an oral capsule that can be taken daily. And if patients are enrolled in this trial, they have a 75% chance of receiving this medication earlier on in the trial. So I just wanted to highlight a few things. Once patients get enrolled, and even before that, we basically run through this rescue plan um, in place that will be in place for patients on clinical trials. The first thing is to be aware that there is a very small proportion of patients that are actually on placebo in both of these trials. And these trials also have rescue therapy in place in the case of flare-ups. 
And there is also where there's options of long-term extensions with open labels where patients have, all patients get access to the medication should they choose to stay on the trial. And in the case where the disease is not controlled with the trial medication, we have the option to refer and get them seen quickly in our public dermatology outpatient clinics as well. And our second last slide, I just want to highlight the reasoning behind why we still have clinical trials for treatment for eczema. Although this is a lady that was referred to us with after with eczema after failing to pill and map and a JAK inhibitor. She then went on to a trial on venralizumab, which you may be familiar with that is currently used in asthma. And as you can see, her um, eczema has significantly improved and she's almost cleared in less than a year. So this just goes to highlight that although we have two agents that are currently available on PBS, the dupilumab and the ubiducitinib, there may be patients who fail on both of these pair therapies and they need access to other medications and the need, and this highlights the need for further research as well. So this is our lovely team here. Um, and we just wanted to let you know that not, we don't just have on anxiotic dermatitis, but we also run other trials in dermatology at the moment. So if you have any other patients that may benefit from any of these trials, please consider reaching out to us either on our phone, email, or logging onto the clinical trials website to see a list of the currently recruiting trials. Once we're referred or once they make contact with us, we're very happy to liaise directly with the patients to organize further appointments. Thank and, you, everyone. Uh, I'll say here as well, you know, if you refer a patient, we'll obviously keep you updated on what's happening. Um, we'd be really, you know, we'd be really grateful for you if you could, if you see any suitable patients. The, the trial that Honey presented from Evelo Biosciences with the Prevotella probiotic, so that's based on good scientific background so that the, the probiotic has an immunomodulatory effect in different diseases is really quite promising in eczema and I, I when, when we picked this study to participate I thought we will get dozens of people come because you know as you know so many patients with atopic dermatitis have had enough of topical steroids and immunosuppressive therapy and are really quite keen to try other therapies and we I thought that this would really be very popular but I must say so far, we haven't found a lot of patients. Um, maybe patients don't associate the Royal Melbourne Hospital with alternative therapies. But um, yeah, if, if, if you see any patients that are maybe disengaged or are keen to have uh, a therapy for their eczema that's not immunosuppressive, we think this would be really be a good option. One of the reasons we present here. And the other thing I wanted to say that again, what Honey said is, you know, nowadays the, the design of clinical trials has really changed. It is really a good treatment option for patients there is a placebo controlled initial phase, but every patient at the end will get medication and we always have a plan B if, if they're not going well to, you know, to take them off the trial if they want or if we feel they're, they're not progressing. And it is, many patients are interested and keen to try. So it has, of course, has to be the right patient, but we feel that it's really a valid treatment option for many patients, especially also given it's quite limited, difficult to access dermatology services often. Thank you, everyone. We, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop in the chat or the Q&A below as well. Stop sharing this slide. Yes, thanks so much for coming again on, on a 6.30 to 7.30 on a cold night, so. Yes, I'd just like to, um, yeah, reciprocate that. Say thank you to uh, all of our speakers as well for um, presenting tonight for such um, an engaging presentation um, again so if there are any questions feel please feel free to put them into the, the q a box just at the bottom there um, and we'll give you a few minutes to type them in um, my colleague has also just put a survey monkey link in the chat um, so we'd really appreciate it if um, you do have the time just to complete that survey. It just provides us with a bit of feedback on the session and um, just helps us improve for future sessions as well. I think we have a, a question.
Uh, yes, Sue is asking whether we have let the Australian College of Nutrition and Environmental Medicine know about the biome trial. Uh, no, we haven't actually. So yes, that's a good one for us to note, uh, Anthony and Honey. Yeah. So we should. Age limit for patients, that's a very good one. So for the trials, usually over 12, so adolescents at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, obviously, those trials do also run for kids. That's then more at the Royal Children's Hospital. In terms of the targeted therapy, that's a very important question because obviously atopic dermatitis is a disease of childhood and adolescence. So currently on the PBS, dupilumab is listed for 12 years and older, although it's TGA listed from six years. And it will very soon be, be available on the PBS as well for children from six years old. Um, it, it is probably safe in younger kids, but then it's obviously off-label use and that would then really be a matter for having them seen at the Royal Children's Hospital. But with the dupilumab, is very safe and works really well already. We've got good experience with the adolescents from 12 years and older and will soon be listed from six years. Yeah. If you've got any other questions from anybody, feel free to put them into the, the QA box at the bottom of your screen now. And I mean, another thing I would say is, of course, you know, eczema is very often a seasonal disease and it's, it's something to, to consider patients that you know, only get a flare in winter and they can control that and then they're good three quarters of the year. It, it's really a consideration whether they want to go on a biologic ongoing. And I've seen some patients that we really got quite well controlled with uh, appropriate topical therapy as well. It's still very good for them to know that they've got a backup. So it really makes a big difference psychologically to know that if, if the current therapy doesn't work, we will have something that we can offer them. Just as we round out the final few minutes, um, look, I might also just add that uh, following the conclusion of the session, there will be um, a follow-up email sent around to all the, all the attendees. Um, so this will contain um, some resources as well as a recording of tonight's session. Um, also, if you're interested in any of our other future events, um, you can find them all on our website. We've got um, a range of great events up there. Um, very good question here. What about the safety profile of long-term use with targeted therapy? So um, with Dupilumab, with the clinical trials and everything, there's more than 10 years experience now. I would say it's overall really very safe, apart from the side effects that we've shown, uh, conjunctivitis and potentially some the red face and maybe melasthesia infections. But overall, not dissimilar to in psoriasis, really quite good safety profile. Um, that JAK inhibitors I would be a lot more cautious. It, well, we have to say that the JAK inhibitors that we now get for eczema are a lot more targeted than the first generation of JAK inhibitors like tofacitinib. But I personally would feel that uh, I'm just a bit skeptical in general that it, you know that they, they immunosuppress a lot more broadly, which means they work a lot better for many things. In eczema, in in particular, the JAK inhibitors work brilliantly well when someone has a really bad flare don't even need to give them prednisolone anymore. So they, they kick in really very quickly. But in the long run, we don't really know that there's some indication that there may be genetic imprinting and, and quite broad changes if, so um, to be seen. But with the biologics, for someone who's got really severe eczema, I wouldn't have any concerns. If you think about all the other potential long-term sequelae of having really severe eczema, including the atopic march, developing type one sensitizations, severe asthma, having broken skin, all the effect that has on their life as well, frequent super infections, frequent antibiotic use. That's really something where I would feel very comfortable. Thank you, Professor Kern. Um, look, it is just ticked over to 7.30. Um, so look, if you do have any other questions, uh, please feel free to um, email the PHN. We're happy to um, provide those questions to the speakers and um, disseminate them back to you. So look, in the final wrap up, thank you again to um, all of our great speakers for presenting tonight. And thank you to all of our attendees for um, joining us tonight at this webinar. We thank you uh, for joining us and we uh, hope to see you at another session in the future. So thank you all and have a great evening.
Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Hamish and Selena. Thank you, guys.